I know you've already been experiencing God's presence. I'm confident of that. But let's ask the Holy Spirit, the great teacher, the one who unfolds Father God's word for us. Let's ask him for his help. Precious Father, we're just so thankful that you have Holy Spirit on assignment here right now in our living rooms, in our life, in our hotel room, in our car, Lord. He's on assignment unfolding the treasures, the secrets of your word so that we, your children, can discover, take hold, apply them to our lives. So we ask for help. Lord, we never want to assume it. We ask for help and we believe we receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God, we are in Why We Worship, part three. This has been such an exciting, exciting series this far. This has been so exciting. I, I've really myself been just indulging in God's word and reminded of how important worship is and why we worship, the reason for it, why we worship. And today in part three, I want to zone in. I want to focus on the power of of worship. In part one, we learn from Jesus that there's such a thing as true worshipers. And we discovered that true worship of God comes with results, outcome, multiplication. Aren't you glad about that? In part two, we learned about weaponized worship and how Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's so good. He came to evict any and all evil spirits. My friend, if you're dealing with an enemy like sickness or poverty, oppression and depression, get your praise on and worship the Lord God Almighty. As a worshiper, we're armed with the spirit and truth so that the enemy has to run, flee when we practice the presence of God. True worship is an activation point of faith, existential faith. As the book of James says, faith ain't faith unless it works. Of course, that's a little bit of a Stephen paraphrase there, right? No enemy can stand before the manifest presence of God. Every knee must bow. It has to. We read in Ephesians 6 verse 12 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. So we see, and some of us for the first time, that true worship is weaponized against the devil for complete victory, overcoming, enforcing the triumph of God's kingdom here on earth. Now, part three, the power of worship. Understand this, worship in and of itself has no power. Kind of like this extension cord. What I'm talking about is the outcome of properly connecting to the source of all life, light, and love. True worshipers engage in true worship. That obedience is medium. It's a medium that transfers power. So when I say the power of worship, I'm saying the power made available when we humbly acknowledge and magnify God, right? In this part three, we will discover from the meaning of worship that there is safety and intimacy when we worship God properly. And secondly, in this session, we'll learn that the power of worship has a refining work to it because... Well, it evokes the presence of God. Dreams, motives, plans, and yes, even lives get refined in the presence of God. They get pruned for the better and more multiplication. Let's look at the Hebrew meaning for worship. The Hebrew word for worship is shaka, meaning to bow down, to fall flat in reverence. The Hebrew word shaka is made up of three letters with one of them being he, meaning outstretched arms, ready to receive and behold, to pay attention to what follows, what follows worship. This is important. Lifting your hands is an act of worship, and it's not just an empty ritual unless it's done in ignorance with no faith expectation or unless it's done for show and attention. Hey, look at me. Lifting your hands is in alignment with the Bible's meaning of worship. Outstretched arms, ready to receive, ready to behold what God will do, looking for what will follow God's presence. Now, that's expectation, isn't it? And expectation connects the power of worship.
Psalm 63 verse 4 says this, So will I bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Think about a little child's instinctive upward reach to a parent or a grandparent. Come on! Don't those little hands of that child speak of expectation? I've got a dear friend of mine who's a great pastor, and one day he told me, Stephen, the first time that I put on Living Room Church on my screen with my family and the worship started, I realized I felt awkward at home. I'm used to getting lost in a crowd in some big building on a Sunday, but I was embarrassed to say I felt very self-conscious in my own home with my family lifting my hands in worship. I pushed through, he said, but I couldn't believe how I had unconsciously moved my habit of worship into a building with people that I hardly knew and away from my own home and family. What happened? Well, he's not alone. Many have unintentionally deactivated worship in their home for a traditional sanitized version that's more ritual, but with little to no outcome. That's not profitable to you. Paul wrote this to his protege in 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. Therefore, I want men to pray everywhere by lifting up hands that are holy. Everywhere. Activating God's presence everywhere. It's a faith thing, not a be weirdo thing. Built into the word for worship is an expectation, outstretched arms, and upward reverence while bowing down low. And there is also safety built into those three Hebrew letters, directing us to an inner sanctuary where God reveals himself to you. Oh yes, safety. What a necessary outcome in this dangerous world right now. Right away, you're, you might be thinking of Psalm 91, starting at verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. On Him I lean and rely, and in Him I confidently trust. Why do we worship? Oh, my friend, if it were only for the outcomes and blessings of Psalm 91, that would be far more than enough to fulfill that faith pleases God mandate, right? Living in the presence of God, you remain stable, safe in the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand, by the way. He's our refuge. He's our fortress. We lean on, rely on, trust in Him. What a way to start the day, to shout and pray to have fun and play. yippee ki -yay. <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell, the 19th century inventor of the telephone, said this, neither the army nor the navy is of any protection or very little protection against aerial raids. Here's the point of this. All the natural things we do to protect our family and ourselves against many diseases, loss, and other enemies are feeble at best. Insurance and wealth doesn't insulate from mortality. And what army, navy, or even air force has any means to protect you from demonic assault, spiritual darkness, wickedness in high places, and the voice of accusation that haunts you in the tallest palace? Mortality can't save us for immortality. This, this is why we worship. Surely you don't believe that going to a chapel or a cathedral or a church building on a Sunday is the antidote to evil and spiritual wickedness. This is why we worship at home, because it's where we live, pay our bills, make life decisions. It's headquarters for our family. If you're going to worship God anywhere to experience His presence, do it in the center of your life. You don't need God so much in some building across town, do you? You need Him in your home, in your life, with your family. Why do we worship? To know God, to love on God, and to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Albert Einstein, the brilliant physicist, said this, Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. God has fearfully and wonderfully created you in His image, but you were made to thrive, to live and move and have your being in His presence. So, 
much like a fish trying to climb a tree, you're not the excellent version of yourself without God's presence, without that context. You're a fish out of water. You and I were made for that intimacy with God. It's where we were meant to live, abide, exist in His presence. That's why religious ritual is such a distraction from true worship. No outcome. Oh, Everybody worships, but even in the context of a religious ritual, it's often our efforts and self-sacrifice that we're trusting in. Even a good old-fashioned atheist is a worshiper of something. It could be human intellect, self, the natural world without respect of the owner-operator. It takes a lot of faith for a person to disbelieve in an intellectual God and put ultimate trust in a closed system with laws of thermodynamics in reverse. Now that's serious, vain worship. Our focus is on the power of true worship, the God kind of worship. Remember, worship is not necessarily singing or musical. It can be, but doesn't have to be. The key is something great from God always follows when you engage in true shaka. Now, I want you to make sure that you don't miss the next installment of this series, Why We Worship, part four, because I'm going to have a guest or two maybe helping me to present on this topic, the reward of worship. That's what's going to be in part four. But I'd like to overlap the concept of the reward of worship with the power of worship in a critical area of life that I believe many, many people are dealing with. It's the tormenting and often fatal enemies called loneliness and condemnation. The power of worship can defeat loneliness and all that condemnation from the past. It was reported in a national news outlet recently that the number one epidemic in North America is loneliness. The U.S. Surgeon General, citing scientific research, said about one in two adults in America reported experiencing deep loneliness. Loneliness is detrimental to mental and physical health. Experts say leading to an increased risk of heart disease, dementia, stroke, and premature death. Now, pile some good old-fashioned guilt, condemnation, and shame on top of that. Oh my goodness, now you can see why things like alcoholism, drug addiction, doom spending, emotional eating, and radicalized life decisions, they're just so popular. Too often, suicide becomes the final antidote, the final option. Oh, listen to me. You were meant for God's presence, and without God's abiding presence, you're going to always feel empty and lost like you're always consuming and still never full. The power of worship plugs you into the resurrection and the life and eternal perspective. Look at what Paul the Apostle said about the knowledge of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. He said, if the dead are not raised at all, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we will be dead. He said, consumerism, that's all you got left, just eat and drink. Fill up because tomorrow it's all a waste. The power of worship illuminates the hope of life, the full of life. As you live in God's presence, this is why it's so important for you to understand that worship isn't about music. Worship is that act of obedience that causes us to draw near to God and God to us. It's not about performance, but about faith expectation, the outcome of defeating loneliness and condemnation. It's not God's will or desire for you to be stuck in shame, blame, and guilt. Not His will. God is glorified as we praise Him and worship Him. He's not exalted by your shame and guilt. God wants you positioned to receive from Him. Because you know what? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's what Hebrews eleven six says. How can we truly worship God and it not be loaded with faith that is pleasing to Him? After all, James 1, 17 said, Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Ephesians 3, 12 says, Come boldly into God's presence through faith in Christ. So, can you imagine as one of God the Father's children climbing up into his lap and having him say, Angels, angels, 
What, what is it? it? It's got arms and legs. Get it off of me. Get it off of me. No, no, never, ever would that happen. As 1 John 4, 4 says, you are God's dear child. He loves you. He loves you so much. He loves your born again presence. Oh, never underestimate the power of your true worship, my friend. You are loved. Although worship isn't necessarily singing, it can include music and often has in Scripture. It's really about humbling yourself, ascribing worth and value to God, and with outstretched arms, looking to what follows. Behold. If there's no sense of behold, you strip the Hebrew word of a whole one-third of its meaning. And therefore, it's no longer biblically true worship. So we will not do that around here, right? Say this, I'm not going to do that in my life or my home. Hey, you've got to keep it real or you'll live a lie. That's religious form denying the power. Note this, something of God always follows when you engage in true shaka. King Jehoshaphat and his people in 2 Chronicles 20, we read about that. When they began to sing, guess what? They saw the victory, an amazing victory. Abraham, when he bowed before the Lord in Genesis 18, 12, verse 2, Sarah got pregnant at 90 years old. Woo! Hannah bowed before God in the temple and got her miracle breakthrough of a family. Knowing real worship helps you identify religious, pretentious, nothingness worship. Look at Mark 7, verse 7. This is Jesus talking, and he says, In vain, fruitlessly and without profit, do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments and precepts of men. I had to remind you of that scripture again. You see, God gets no pleasure out of vain, empty worship. Worship that has no outcome, no profit, no results, no fruit, just a big pile of nothing following Sunday on Monday morning. You see, this scripture in the Old Testament always shocks me. Isaiah 45, verse 19. I did not, this is God talking. He says, I did not call the descendants of Jacob to a fruitless service saying, seek me for nothing. But I promise them a just reward. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, the truth, trustworthy, straightforward correspondence between deeds and words. I declare things that are right. God never in any place in his word says, seek me, worship me just for nothing. Just do it for nothing. If you're just singing so others can hear how good you sound, it's empty, it's useless, it's a waste. If you're lifting your hands in church to be noticed and considered religious, you're wasting your life and your energy. If you're doing service for God as a sacrifice because you feel guilty and you're distracted from the obedience that God really wants from you, true worship, shaka, bowing low with your arms open to all the goodness God the Father wants to pour into your life, well, then you're wasting your time. Service for nothing. When my wife Pam was a very young woman, in fact, I believe she was a teenager, she was going through a season in her life when she felt very discouraged. She felt lost, lonely, and very depressed. Her parents were amazing people, ministers, but they just couldn't seem to help her no matter what they did. Late one night, she got out of bed because she couldn't sleep, and as she stood in the kitchen whispering to God, please, please help me, God, help me, she began to softly sing a new song, a new song she'd never sung before to the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings His praise again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Right there in that kitchen, God flooded Pam with His presence, and her life was never, ever the same again. The loneliness, the depression, they were overpowered by God's presence, his love, his goodness. The light came into the darkness. Pam wrote that song, Hallelujah, Praise the Lamb, and it went around the world, sung by thousands and thousands of congregations to this day, recorded by many Christian artists. But the real story here is this. God met Pam in her parents' kitchen, flooded her heart, and showed her the outcome of 
the power of worship, true worship. Let's look at the word for sing now. Let's look at what the Bible means when it says to sing to the Lord. Sing in Hebrew is zemir, which is one of those rare Hebrew words with a dual meaning. It means to sing, but it also means to prune. Some Hebrew scholars believe that although the word has a dual meaning, they are somehow intrinsically intertwined and connected. When you sing unto the Lord, you prune away the bad, the unfruitful, the sickness, the disease. Great evidence of our faith is in our worship. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. That's Hebrews 11 verse 1. When we have great needs in our life, we magnify the Lord for the answer from Him. The answer that we don't see, not what we do see, our worship is evidence that we believe for what we don't see. To practice spiritual protocol in a severe crisis seems foolish to worldly thinking, to worldly ideas. Singing and worshiping when there's trouble, trial, terror, makes it decidedly all about God's goodness and not about the circumstances. It's all about his character and not about our convenience. Once again, the greatest evidence of our faith is our true worship. What comes out of your heart directed toward God? What comes out of you when you're in a trial or a tribulation of your life? Is it praise or is it doubt, scorn? Is it thanksgiving or is it resentment? Proverbs 27, verse 21 says this, As the refining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so let a man be in the trial of his praise, ridding himself of all that is base or insincere. For a man is judged by what he praises and of what he boasts. We talk about singing having a pruning quality. There is a trial of praise that measures the character of a person. When you're praised or promoted, it's one of the greatest tests of your character. When you experience praise, does humility come forth or are you filled with pride and arrogance? Praise acts as a multiplier. Praise God and his presence manifests more and more and more. Praise a man with very little character and you will awaken the tyrant and dictator in him. Even if he's only three years old, addressing character issues is just basic discipleship. Simon Cowell, the celebrity, entrepreneur, judge of American Idol, America's Got Talent, he said this, people confuse ego, lust, insecurity with true love. How is that possible? Well, without the straight edge of God's word, the terms get hijacked, don't they? The power of worship promotes safety in God's presence, but it also defines genuine spiritual intimacy. Real love is revealed, so you can't confuse it with lust, arrogance, abuse, and a self-centered agenda. Again, true worship sharpens one's character by eliminating what doesn't belong. Ask yourself this, as a believer of Christ Jesus, am I growing? Is my character evolving upward into God's morality and likeness? If not, are you really experiencing the power of worship? Dwayne Johnson, the famous movie star and also known as The Rock when he was a pro wrestler, he said this, the ego can be the great success inhibitor. It can kill opportunities and it can kill success. Well, Mr. Rock, that's the least of it. Pride, the Bible says, comes before a downfall. The power of worship has the supernatural ability to eliminate character issues like pride, immorality, idolatry, hatred, arrogance, selfishness, envy, and all the stuff that sinks your boat in life. We all need pruning to bring forth a character for the finer. Elimination is not a bad word. When we sing to God, worship Him, we humble ourselves in His presence, and the fire of His love is able to burn off all the chaff of our weakness. Our flaws and wrong thinking are removed. Then the laser of God's love cauterizes, and we receive His mind in us. Our opinions are replaced with truth, and that brings life, peace, joy, and contentment. Pam and I know this couple, dear friends of ours, that love God with all of their heart. And after that, they love their adult son, his wife, and their children. Several years ago, that son basically went off the deep end. 
Prosperity brought him into a trial of praise and his character collapsed as he turned to pharmaceuticals and drugs to cope with life. Along with many other very immoral choices, he was ruining his life, his marriage, and facing losing everything. He acted like he hated, hated his mom and dad. What did his parents do? Well, Pam and I, we had communion with them. What a privilege. We prayed together. And then they worshiped God. They just elevated, yes, jacked up their habit of worshiping God. And in the midst of their pain, they worshiped. They poured out their heart and worshiped God. That young man has come back to Jesus. That young man has come back to his parents, restored, an amazing young guy. Do you have family, loved ones, that need to be saved from their insanity, but they won't listen? They won't receive help? Don't be afraid. Do not worry or fret. Worship. Worship God. This is why we worship. This is where the power of worship really, really matters. People need help, and often it's help they don't even know they need or want. The power of worship works. John 4, 23, remember what Jesus said. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Hebrews 11, verse 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Worship is an extension. It's an extension of your faith. Worship is an extension of your faith. Where God is important, he works. Where God is not important, he can't work. Well, Pastor Stephen, how in the world do I make God important in my life, in my home, in my living room? Ah, now we're asking the right questions. You never get the right answers until you ask the right questions. I believe you know what the answer is now. Worship God. If you want answers from heaven in your home, worship God in your home. Lift him up. Lift up your hands with a heart full of expectation. Magnify the Lord. Worship him. We worship God because he is important, all important. And we long to, wish to, need for him to work in our life, in our family, in our world. Let's practice right now what we've been talking about. Let's worship God. And if your heart has been wanting to surrender all of your life to Jesus so that you can be called a true worshiper, just pray this with me. And then we'll all worship God as one united family. Use your voice. Pray this after me. God, you see the challenges. You know what I'm facing. I really need your help. I can't fix this on my own. Help me, God. Right now, I humble myself. I worship you. And I believe for results. The outcome will confirm your word. Jesus is my Savior. He died on the cross, rose up from the grave. He sits on the throne as King. Say, I believe that. Give me victory, Lord. I give you all the praise. Save my family. Give us your victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.